Psalm 58, Ephesians 2 and Psalm 58. We're studying Genesis 3, but we'll not get there for a good while this morning, if at all. Ephesians 2 and Genesis chapter number 3. We have seen from the third chapter of Genesis that in that garden where God placed man and gave that man but one commandment to obey, the man without a fallen nature, the man without any sin in his past, the man chose to sin. And as a result of that, the Bible says in Romans 5 and 12, by one man's sin entered the world and death by sin. And our topic this morning is the nature of the man. That is, what is man by nature when you receive from God the gift of a brand new, smiling, sparkling little baby? What's on the inside? of that beautiful little child, what's on the inside of that first grader, what's on the inside of that teenager, what's on the inside of that man, what's on the inside of that senior citizen. And the Bible, the Bible view is so different than the world view in almost, I mean, just pick a topic, just pick a topic, and the Bible will be at the North Pole and the world's view will be at the South Pole. In, in my lifetime, the trusted voice in America has shifted. It was once the preacher with the Bible. Today it is the psychiatrist with the drugs. A preacher is examined by the community. How does he live? What's his family-like life? Does he pay his bills? What kind of reputation does he have? Where did he get his training? What was he like in the last town where he lived before he came here? People pay money to the psychiatrist and believe every word he says and never ask one question about his character, his conduct, his family, his history, his track record, his own emotional well-being. It's amazing. It's amazing that you would take life-changing, life-altering advice from someone you know nothing about other than that he has an office. And you would come to church and hear a preacher tell you the truth of the Bible. And you'd question everything he says because you don't know enough about him yet. It's pretty strange. Pretty strange. If a psychiatrist told you you have a certain emotional problem, you would say, based on what? What is your scientific evidence? If my chemical is, is unbalanced, what is the right balance for the chemicals? How many chemicals do I have in my brain and what balance should each of them have? You don't ever ask that question. You just take the pill. If the preacher says you must be born again, you say, what do you mean by born again? Well, other religions have different views. Well, who are you to tell me? How are you? Now, I'm not saying you should believe everything a preacher says, but it's odd that we live in a nation that believes everything a shrink says as though there were some verifiable scientific test you could take to prove that you were bipolar. I can do blood work and find out I'm diabetic. I can, do blood, I, I, I can run a test and find out I've got a kidney problem. What's the test to prove I have a psychological disorder and I'm going to begin taking suicidal thought pills to adjust myself, to bring myself in line with what? All right, so let's get that out of the way. Secondly, the school system, the news media, Disney, Hollywood, and the, the average church approaches life from this viewpoint. Man's really good. There's just a few of them do some bad things once in a while, but, but it's, it, it's not really who they are. The meth head shoots somebody robbing the house and the cameraman tunes in on his mom and the reporter sticks a microphone in, his, in her face and she says, he was such a good boy. Such a good boy. He has driven you out of your mind since he was six years old. 
He was never a good boy, but you want to tell yourself he is, and this is some abnormality. I mean, other than his, his, his uh, you know, juvenile arrests, and other than his, his expulsion from school, and other than his knife fights, and other than his drug addiction, and other than the time that he robbed you of everything you had, he's really a good boy. And this carries all the way to the grave when people stand over the corpse of a low-life loser and talk about how he just got his wings and now he's singing the heavenly choir. And the reason that ministers buy into this is because they have long since abandoned telling the truth and have decided to go straight for the wallet and bypass the heart altogether. And you can't make a good living these days telling people the truth. And so you just lie to people who have been taught from the day of their birth, if they believe in themselves, they can do anything. Other than graduate, hold a job, get to church on time, repair their car, stay married, but just believe in yourself. I've seen a lot of people this week that should not believe in themselves. The overwhelming majority of people's life should tell them it's time to stop believing in yourself. And that's that's the theme not only on the television, but sadly now in the pulpit. Why, Why do we need a God? Why do we need a Redeemer? Why do we need Jesus Christ when we have ourself? May I give you a gospel track? No, I'm good. No, actually, you're not. <laughs> Can I give you something about Jesus? No, I don't need that. Everything about you screams out that you do. But your mom said you didn't, and your dad said you didn't, and the last movie you watched said you didn't, and the music you listened to said you didn't. And one time you went to church, and the minister said you didn't. But the Bible says you do. So the reason people don't read the Bible, or if they do read it, they want to get a living something or other, or a message something or other, or a new American, or a new world, or a new international, or something new, is because this book doesn't really have too many good things to say about man. All the good things it has to say, it has to say about God and His Son, Jesus Christ. And if you want to get anything good said about you, you'll have to get right behind Jesus. So when God aims something at Jesus, it looks like it's coming your way. (laughs) Because it really wasn't. I'm going to heaven because I'm in Christ. I can stand before God because I'm in Christ. As long as He doesn't see me, I'm okay. But whenever He fixes His holy eyes on me, it's not good. It's not good. What the world wants, they want a thought process and a religion and a translation that's just out of focus enough to where you can kind of imagine the thing looks like what you want it to look like instead of what it actually looks like. But this morning we are going to enjoy seeing what the Bible says about what man is by his very nature. And it's not a pretty picture, but we need it. We need it, or we're going to be as crazy as the people we're trying to deal with. You know they're crazy. (laughs) This world's absolutely crazy. Combined total debt now is like $40 trillion. What is that? You can't even... You don't even know what that is, but it's $40 trillion. That's, that's federal, state, county, municipal. That's not the people living in town. That's just people in town. And so what we need in order to get rid of this $40 trillion in debt is we need more time off. Less work and more handouts and... and so anybody with a brain could figure out that's not going to work. Yeah, but who can find anybody with a brain? That's... See, when you throw out the Bible, you're left with yourself. And believing in yourself is 
So that's kind of dangerous. It's dangerous in Korea, it's dangerous in China, it's dangerous in Iran, it's dangerous in Afghanistan, it's dangerous on the border, it's dangerous across the border, it's dangerous at the shopping center, it's dangerous in your living room. In fact, if you read Genesis through to Revelation, you won't find one place where God even suggests you should believe in yourself or trust in yourself. But you should believe on the Lord and trust the Lord. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. I'm, I'm in a good mood today. I hope you're in a good mood today. And, and um, just in a couple of hours, you'll be curling up on the sofa or in the bed and making up for that hour of sleep you lost with a three-hour nap. <laughs> just to make sure. <laughs> so let's pray. Father, help us, please. Help us to trust you and not this crazy world. Please, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. All right, Ephesians 2, Ephesians 2, this is the Bible, the Holy Bible, the Word of God. Ephesians 2 and verse number 1 says, And you, writing to save people, hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Okay, so here's the first three things characterize the life of everybody that's not saved. Dead, trespasses, sins. That's not positive. That's not trustworthy. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. No parent ever, beginning with Adam and Eve, no parent has ever had to teach a child to disobey. Every single parent of every single child has had to teach the child to obey. And yet somehow we live in this assumption that people are basically good. Show me one. There's never been one. There'd never been a little boy that didn't have to hear no, 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 no. And there's never been a little girl who didn't have to, have to hear, don't, 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 don't. There is something instinctive about disobedience, and there is something seemingly absent about obedience. That's the Bible. Verse 3, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in fulfilling the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Now here's what God says about the nature of those who come from Adam. If you allow your flesh to have what it wants instinctively, you will find yourself doing the wrong thing. If you allow your mind to think upon what it wants to think upon instinctively, you will be thinking the wrong thing. It is not in our nature to desire what is right, it is not in our nature to think correctly. Therefore, you cannot have children raising themselves, they have to have parents. And the more situations you have where you remove one of the two God-ordained parents the closer your society is going to, become, going to come to total collapse. Because you're at a 50% disadvantage from the day that child is born. Okay? If the absent party is the father, now the child is left to be raised by the sympathetic one, not the disciplinary one. And so your disadvantage has gone up to about 80%. Since there's only one parent, that one parent is going to have to go to work. And now you've got almost a 0% chance that that child in its formative years is going to receive enough no's and enough don'ts to counter wrong thinking and wrong desires that are pre-programmed into that child because of sin. Who you vote for isn't going to change that. How much money you spend on public schools isn't going to change that. 
So we put the kid in the school bus. And they're all sweet little first, second, and third graders. But you have to have a monitor on the school bus. Why? When you get to school, you have to have principal, vice principal, sheriff's deputies. Why? Aren't they all good kids? There's just a few bad apples. <laughs> There's just a few bad apples as long as you have enough enforcement in place to keep the rest of them doing what they want to do. If you have enough police and enough military and enough jails and enough prisons and enough judges, you can get all the good people to live good lives. Why do you have to have all that stuff if everybody's so good? Our flesh goes wrong immediately. Our thoughts go wrong immediately. That's why the Bible says, God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Pretty powerful. Psalm 58, Psalm 58, spring is in the air, birds are singing outside, life is wonderful. Psalm 58, Psalm 58, and verse number 3, Psalm 58, verse number 3, here's the verse on the age of accountability that you've heard so much about, a term not found in the Bible. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. How about that? It's three o'clock in the morning. And the blood-curdling scream from the crib says, If you don't come feed me right now, I'm going to die. But that's a lie. You can lie there and be hungry for a little while and let mom sleep. But you're not going to. You're going to exa exaggerate your distress until you get what you want when you want it. And nobody else in that house is going to get any rest until you get your way. Ah, my diaper's dirty! Well, roll over and deal with it. <laughs> I'm sleepy. You do not have to teach someone to misrepresent the facts. You do not have to teach someone to put themselves ahead of others. You do not have to teach someone that the whole world should revolve around them. That, that comes with the car. It's standard equipment. Psalm, uh, Proverbs 29, Proverbs chapter 29. I can't believe you're saying those awful things about my... Your baby's wonderful. It's a gift from God. Fruit of the womb is his reward. It's fearfully and wonderfully made. Trouble is, they're just sinning that little thing. And if you allow that sin to go unchecked and undealt with, it's going to ruin its life and your life. Proverbs 29. Proverbs 29 and verse 15. Oh, can, are we even allowed to read this anymore? I guess we are. The rod and reproof give wisdom. Now watch. But a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Now that's, that's the Bible. That's the Word of God. It's the Word of God. Mr. Rogers might disagree. Sesame Street might disagree. Captain Kangaroo, we're getting closer, might disagree. But the Bible says if you don't deal with that little toddler, that little toddler is going to go the wrong way. If you don't deal with that little boy learning to ride that bicycle, he's going to take that car to a place it shouldn't go. You cannot leave. This is a blanket statement from God. You cannot leave any child to decide for itself right from wrong. Decide for itself whether or not to believe in Jesus Christ. You know, you just, I just don't think you should force these children. They should, you should wait till they grow up and let them make their own decisions. And so they can turn out like you? God gave able parents. God gave Cain parents. 
He didn't just pop them up out of the ground. Oh, it's time for two more children. Boom, children. He brought them into the world with a father and with a mother because somebody has to, well, the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go. Because he's not going to find that way on his own. She's not going to find that way on her own. Why? It's not in our nature to do the right thing. Why don't we just put all the kids in the nursery and not have nursery workers? I mean, they're all good kids, right? You haven't been in there. Well, you know, we just need a peacekeeping initiative. And if we had a United Nations, we could stop wars. And stop wars, you can't stop two-year-olds from fighting over toys. Nobody taught them that. I want it. He's got it. Ah. (laughs) Throwing things, hitting each other, punching each other. Nursery workers tied up in a corner. People are strange, man. The only experts I know on raising kids are people who never had any. Man, they can tell you exactly how you... Oh, yeah, I'll tell you what I'd do if that was my child. Well, here. <laughs> Take them and do it. <laughs> this idea you can just sit a kid in a daycare or a public school or in front of a television and they're going to turn out all right is why we've got the turnout we've got. You cannot leave that child to itself or the end result will be shame. Now, So what's the Bible saying? Your nature, your nature is not correct. It has to be corrected. Okay? Now let's look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. That's, that's the first point. The second one's not any better. We're by, by nature child of wrath. Secondly, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14. But the natural man, it's what man is by nature, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Here's here's what the, the Bible just said. There is no true communion between God and His fallen creatures. And it's not because God doesn't desire to communicate. It's because fallen man cannot, will not, does not want to receive it. Right now, this this is kind of a freaky thing to think about, so don't think about it. Leave it to me. Uh, Right now, passing through this room are 50, 60 different signals from radio stations. All kinds of TV programs are flying through this room right now. But other than a couple of you who have taken the Mark of the Beast implant, uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, Those signals are flying through this room, but we have nothing whereby to receive them. If you had a radio, or a, how many remember radios? Or a, or a TV set, or a cell phone that you had left on during church instead of turning off so you could listen to preaching, that device would enable you to receive those signals. And you could, you could pull it up on your phone, and you could, you could hear the voices, and you could see the pictures, and it's all there, you just can't receive it. God's power, God's grace, God's love, God's might, God's wisdom, God's truth, it is all around you. But if you're unsaved, if you don't have the Holy Spirit inside you, you don't have a receiver. You don't have anything to pull that truth of God into your heart and into your mind. Now listen, I'm I'm not being critical of, of anybody, I'm just telling you it's a fact. You take a boy and a girl with Christian parents and you bring them to Sunday school and they are distracted. It's hard to hold their attention through a 30-minute Sunday school lesson. 
You bring them out of Sunday school, you sit them in church. There's godly music. The Bible's open. The preacher's preaching. You leave here and go to the restaurant and you sit them down and on the wall is a TV screen. The sound's not even on. (laughs) Son, eat your food. There is no food. (laughs) Son, sit up straight. I'm not sitting. You don't have to say be still. You don't have to say watch it. You don't have to say pay attention to that. Why? Because there's something inside that kid that goes, wow, about that sewage pumped out of Hollywood. And there's nothing in his heart that says, oh, I want to hear what the preacher has to say. I'm moving. I'm 3D. It's odd, isn't it? It's really odd how captivating the world is without anyone saying, pay attention to that. And how uninteresting the things of God are without anybody saying, oh, that's bad, you shouldn't listen to that. Isn't it odd? Now, you know what the average parent does? They bow the knee to the devil and they give their kids everything they're interested in and they don't force them to be interested in anything they're not interested in. And so your kids love Batman and Superman and other lies and they don't love Jesus. You say, well, it's just, it's just my, it's not just your child, it's every child. Fallen sinners love lies more than they love truth. You've got to deal with that, not surrender to it. Well, my son was born with a predisposition. So was every son. Dads used to take care of that early and often. Now everybody just bows the knee to the flesh. Well, my daughter, she was just born with this inclination too, and you're going to bow down and worship it? Why don't you take the sword of the Spirit and drive it out? See, the shrinks have told you Your child came perfect, and it's your job to make sure that child knows she's perfect. And the Bible said, wrong, wrong, wrong. Your child came imperfect, and it's your job to teach the child to subdue his or her imperfections and to force themselves to do what's right until they can get saved and get the Holy Spirit and get a little help with it. You don't agree with that. Well, then go hang out in front of the public school and watch what crawls out of there when the bell rings. That's right. Well, they're just wonderful. They'll rob you blind and take everything you got. They'll curse you. They'll flash you. They'll mock your God. And nobody taught them to do any of that. It just showed up in them because somebody didn't correct them. 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy 2. Now, we'll we get to the ladies. Uh, they got some particular things. We'll talk about that in a week or two. But this morning, gentlemen, gentlemen, this, this, is, this is you. This is just for you. Wife, wake your husband up. Tell him, listen to this, this one right here. 1 Timothy 2. 1 Timothy 2. Verse 14. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Now, man does not need to be taught to sin, sins in his nature. We, we saw that. Yet man cannot claim innocence or ignorance when he does sin because God has put within him, you want that fruit? You ate it. God has put within him the knowledge of good and evil, and he knows. He knows. He's not sinning because he doesn't know he's sinning. He's sinning because he wants to sin. Why does the child who steals the cookie hide it when mother comes? Why does the boy take his first drink out in the woods in a car with his friends? Why don't you wave the money around when you steal it? 
People claim they don't know right from wrong. They do know right from wrong. They just want to do wrong. And if you don't force them by every means possible to do right, they won't. They won't. So, man is a child of wrath by nature. He does not receive the things of God and he sins by choice. I almost just feel like putting on a sweater and buttoning it and just sitting here and chatting with you. Today's word is sinner. (laughs) Bet you never heard that one. Here comes Mr. Green Jeans, boys and girls. Today's going to talk to you about repenting. (laughs) What's that big bird? Our word is sodomites. We'll get to that in a second. (laughs) All right, the somewhat positive side. Somewhat positive side. Come to Romans chapter number 1 and John chapter 1. Romans 1 and John 1. This is what everybody knows. When they come into the world, a gift from God given to all the fallen sons and daughters of Adam. Everyone born in the world has these things going for them. Romans 1, verse 19. Romans 1, uh, 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. So though man is born with a sin nature, he is born knowing there is a God, and that God is all-powerful, and that man is accountable to God. Everyone my age and older knew that. First grade, sixth grade, tenth grade, college. These boys and girls growing up today, not, not, not these that are blessed to grow up in a church like this, learning the Bible. Their father's absent. Their mother's at work. They're at a, they're at a public facility from age four to age to, to twelfth grade, if they make it that far. And they're taught, there's no God, you're an animal. There's no creator, there's no creation. You are an accidental chance of molecules figuring out how to change from rocks into chimpanzees. They have been educated into atheism. They have become, by design, they have become fools. You wonder why women in America who are free to get on an airplane, book themselves a motel room, and march in the street, don't march in the street to say, thank God for the USA, but march in the street to say we're slaves and we're in bondage. To what? They're fools. People sitting in a house, working people paid for, watching cable TV that working people pay for, eating food that working people pay for, are watching someone talk about how mistreated the poor are in America. You'd think they could figure that out, but they can't. They've been educated out of common sense. They believe in themselves. They don't believe they'll get a job this week. They don't believe they'll pay their own bills. They don't believe they'll go back to their husband. They don't believe they'll find out where their children are and try to raise them. But they do believe that if they just got a chance, they could win that karaoke contest and be the next American Idol. 
they believe in themselves. They're beautiful. They stood in front of that mirror, and what they saw in those yoga pants was the model in the catalog. Because they believe in themselves. And they went out in public, nobody dared say anything because... You don't want to harm someone's fragile (laughs) self-belief. Some of you right now, is he allowed to say that? I am. I have a license. (laughs) John chapter 1. John chapter number 1. This guy walks by last night, he's got a, he's got a t-shirt on, he's, he's just out there somewhere, he's got a t-shirt on, it says, I heart NY. And he walks up to Jed, Jed's got a shirt on, says, trust Jesus, Jesus says, Jesus. he says, that shirt, nobody's paying attention to that shirt. Well, how many people have walked up to you and said, I've decided to heart New York? <laughs> people are crazy, man. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, without Him is not anything made that was made, and Him was life, and life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of that light, capital L. See it? That's Jesus Christ. That all men through Him might believe. He was not that light, capital L, Jesus Christ, was sent to bear witness to that light, capital L, Jesus Christ, That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Now you see that? God said everybody born knows there's a God, knows that God is all powerful, knows they are accountable to God, and God put something inside every one of them so that when they look at a statue, something inside said that's not it. When they look at a baptismal font, something inside them says, that's not it. When they look at a totem pole, or a crucifix, or a Buddha statue, or a suicide bomber, something inside them says, that's not it. And that something inside you will continue to testify against everything that is dark until you finally set your eyes on Jesus Christ. And then that's something God put inside you will say, that's your Savior. Now you can accept Him or you can reject Him. And so what this whole world is designed to do, especially our modern society, what's designed to do is to get you to look at something dark and convince yourself it's light. And to look at something that cannot save you and convince yourself, I'm going to save myself by doing this. God gave you light. Now, look at, look at Romans chapter number 2. Romans chapter 2. People say, what about the heathen who've never, never heard? Well, you're concerned about them? Go tell them. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> I'm at Bible school. I'm sitting in front of all these, this board of governors and supervisors and everything, taking this, this oral examination. And one fellow said, uh, he said, well, son, uh, tell us, uh, where do the heathen go? I said, the ones I know go to Kmart and Sears. (laughs) He he didn't like that answer. He said, no, I mean the people over in the jungle. Why would you think people over in the jungle somewhere are different than people in your town? God didn't write four different Bibles. Here's the city Bible. Here's the country Bible. Here's the jungle Bible. Here's the beach Bible. God wrote one Bible because everybody's the same. Romans 2 Romans 2, verse number 11. For there is no respect to persons with God. For as many as have sinned without law shall perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts. 
their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. You know, nations without the Ten Commandments deal with thieves. And they deal with murderers. I don't care if you go to a Christian country or, a, or a, a, an atheist country, people are going to hold you at a signed written contract. Well, who says it's wrong to lie? Well, God does. What about people who don't believe in God? They still don't think it's okay for you to lie to them. I run these atheists, well, I don't believe in God. Well, good, I'll just come over to your house and rob you and steal everything you got. Well, that wouldn't be right. Well, who says so? You're telling me you've got God's laws written in your heart and you don't even believe in God? That's what the Bible says. Now, now look, look how, how twisted and perverted our society is, including the churches. When we see boys and girls and teenagers and homeless people and, and troubled adults do things that everybody has known to be wrong for 6,000 years, we say, well, we shouldn't judge them. Okay, well, what should we do? Well, we should just try to help them. How? The only way you can help them is to say, that's wrong, stop doing it. And quite honestly, that's the only way to help everyone they interact with. But this business of we have to excuse everything because we don't want to be negative, we want to be positive, it's insanity. And we're raising a whole generation of boys and girls who don't even know what bathroom to use. Because dad never said, son, you take one step toward that door, I'm going to knock you in the head. What kind of dad would do that? Pretty much all of them 40 years ago. Now, now dad's supposed to sit there in his skirt and help his son to relate to his inner ballerina. Whole thing's gone crazy, man. Your house on fire and a fire truck pulls up, you better hope a bunch of fruitcakes don't get out. You better hope a bunch of men get out that can bust down the wall and carry you out. Oh, I'm scared of fire. (laughs) This country's so messed up. I don't know how I'm going to straighten it out by myself, but I'm trying. (laughs) Need a little help here. (laughs) Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, ladies, let me tell you something, this, this is not a political statement, um, I felt this way before Mr. Trump did, but if the person you look, to, look up to in this life is Rosie O'Donnell, I almost understand why you're taking those pills. You could look to Jesus Christ and you want to look to angry, unhappy, snarling sociopaths. Messed up, man. Messed up. This country's messed up. Because you get away from this Bible, you're just clueless. Romans 12, verse number 3. For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, Not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. (laughs) See that? But to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man, look, to every man, the measure of faith. There's not a person living to whom God hasn't given enough faith to believe there's a creator who sent his son to die for sins and I'm going to trust Him as my Savior. Everybody has enough faith to get saved. 
Now, if they let the Beatles talk them into putting their faith in Eastern mysticism, they'll lose their soul. If they let CNN convince them to put their faith in Islam, they'll lose their soul. If they let a mega church preacher convince them to put their faith in their bank account or their prosperity, they'll lose their soul. It's the job of the Christian minister and the Christian witness to convince people to put the faith God gave them in the Savior God gave them, who is Jesus Christ. Now, here's a great advantage you have when you witness. Listen, you, the Jehovah's Witness doesn't have this advantage. The Mormon doesn't have this advantage. The, the atheist doesn't have this advantage. You've got an advantage. The Bible says that the mouth of two or three witnesses let every word be established. When you give someone the gospel, there is something inside them that already agrees to what you're saying because God put that inside them. You've got an advantage over all the cults and all the religions and all the isms because you are the second witness. The first witness is inside them. I I don't say it often in church because I'm preaching primarily to save people, but if I preach at at a... uh, rescue mission or a, 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 a public, uh, you know, a school thing or something like that. I will frequently I'll say, you know, I'm telling the truth. I just throw that in there all the time. You know, I'm telling the truth because they do. They may not like it. They may not want to receive it. They may push back against it. But you tell you tell somebody there's a God. They know. They know. Now you say, I, I know. You say, well, I know an atheist. I know some old sign said I'm an atheist. And I'm happy about it and all that. Let, let me tell you something. I was on a flight, uh, wife and I were on a flight a couple of weeks ago, and they made an announcement, and they said, we're sorry, we'll not be serving uh, peanuts on this flight because someone on the flight has a peanut allergy. I thought, man, how am I going to make it from Phoenix to Atlanta without those six peanuts? <laughs> how do you program a machine to stop after seven peanuts go into a bag? Anyway... So, so what they did, they found out this person had this allergy, so they took all the peanuts off the airplane. Now, wouldn't I be nuts to say, as, as the truck rolled away, <laughs> you're, li- you're listening, wouldn't I be nuts to say, as the truck rolled away with the peanuts on it, there are no peanuts. No, you got the peanuts off of one airplane. There's plenty of peanuts. They're just not on your plane. Listen, lady, just because you got God out of your heart doesn't mean there's no God. Just because you tried to dismiss God from your mind doesn't mean there's no God. There's plenty of peanuts out there. You just don't have any. There's plenty of God out there. You just don't have him. Everybody's got to measure of faith. Now, come back to Romans 1. Romans 1. And I'll show you how far we've gone as a society. I got saved in 1976. Mm. Yeah, wow. Started preaching in 1977. There was not a pamphlet. There was not a recorded sermon. There was not a book anywhere that you could find to, show, to instruct you into how to deal with two topics. Islam and homosexuals. So, what's happened in 40 years that has caused our nation to... Look, I don't know how it's going to turn out, but I don't know how it would have turned out. You are on the brink of losing your national identity to a religion that practices murder. You you came that close. You came that close. And you live in a society where in small town, you know, good old small town Deland, the merchants up and down the street want to get rid of People holding signs that say Jesus saves for one hour a week. And almost every business down there is flying a flag that says we love sodomites. 
That's a long way to travel in 40 years. Pretty strange, isn't it? Now, let me show you something. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 and verse number 22. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man and the birds and the four-footed beasts and creeping things. Well, the heathen people have done that for, for thousands of years. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Uh, amen. For this cause, God gave, gave them up to, unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use of that which against nature. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned the lust one toward another. <laughs> In the Greek, there's a, a word there, it's yuck. <laughs> no, it's not, but it should be. Uh, men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Okay, so, so listen, I, look, I know, I know the day and time in which I live. I, I, I know that. We're at the end result of a progression in our society, and the churches bow their knees to Hollywood. And the ministers won't, they, they won't stand up and say anything that thinks going to hurt the offering. So, so listen to what I'm about to tell you. This started... In the 1950s and 60s, when men would not make their sons cut their hair, and women would not make their daughters dress like ladies, because, well, I don't want my children mad at me, and I don't want my children not like me, and and if everybody at the school, and they're going to feel so outcast and so different, and so mom and dad pushed God aside so they could put their son or their daughter on the throne. My dad was such a cruel man. I had to leave school on every other Friday and ride my bike to the barber shop and go in there and get my, my hair cut and go home. And if I got home and it wasn't short enough, I had to ride back to the barber shop and make the man cut it shorter. You wonder why I have emotional issues. <laughs> All my friends had long hair. My dad couldn't care less about my friend's hair. He never even said, well, let me go look at them and see how they look. He didn't care. Okay? So then, so then you progress, and it's the 70s and the, and the 80s, and my white son wants to have an afro. My white son wants to wear spandex pants. My son and my daughter are shopping off the same rack. (laughs) Well, I don't want my son mad at me. I don't want my daughter upset. So mom and dad bow their knee to their son and their daughter. The 90s, it's drugs. You know what I believe? Look, this, this is what I believe. I believe the reason sons and daughters today are coming home and telling mom and dad they're gay is because there's nothing left to upset mom and dad. If you do drugs, so what? Mom's doing drugs. If you drink, so what? Dad was drinking when he was your age. You're fornicating, so what? (laughs) You were born of fornication, son. We never told you. So the only way left for kids to shock mom and dad nowadays is paint their lips black and their fingernails black and say, I'm gay. So what did mom and dad do? They went and told the preacher, and the preacher said, well, you know, the most important thing in the world is making your children happy, so you're just going to have to be okay with it. You know what the Bible said? The Bible said no one by nature is homosexual. That's the Bible. If you believe the Bible, nobody's born that way. But everyone is born with a willingness and a desire to go against God. 
When your society gets so corrupt that drinking is not against God and drugs is not against God and cross-dressing is not against God and lying is not against God and rebellion is not against God, well, the only thing left for you to do is be a homosexual. Because somehow you have to express to the world, I hate the Bible. And when Christian mom and dads leave a church because the preacher said that I should do something about my son and he just doesn't understand. But I do understand. I understand you worship your child, not God, and your child doesn't stand a chance if you don't agree with the Bible. See, I had a tendency as a young child, I had a tendency to cuss. My dad didn't say, well, that's just how he was born. No, he hurt me. (laughs) As a child, I had a tendency to take things that weren't mine. We skipped lunch every, every day. We skipped lunch, and we saved our lunch money, and on Saturday, we got on our bicycles, and we rode to the, to the magic market and poured all that money into a pinball machine. And a couple of times, my dad left some change on his dresser, and a couple of times, I took that change, and the second time, he found out. And this hand has never touched (laughs) anyone's change on a counter ever since. He wasn't a Muslim, so he didn't cut it off. (laughs) But I did enter into life maimed (laughs) rather than enter into hellfire. You see, it's not your job, Mom to accommodate your child's desires. It's your job to accommodate God's desires and to, as far as possible, bring your children into line with that. If not, you're going to contribute to the ruin of America and its churches. The goal now is to have children reasonably able to read and write their own name by the fourth grade. What a goal. Son, I'm sorry. The NEA said you're a retard. I know. You're not supposed to use that word. I'm sorry. Uh, Son, the NEA said you're special. There's nothing special about being 12 and not recognizing your name on the label of your shirt. If you can't do the first grade work, do it again. You don't go to second grade. If you can't pass the second grade work, you do it again. You don't go to the third grade. You say, why is that important? Because one day you're going to be sitting in a church and a man's going to say, here's the rules. If you don't trust Jesus Christ, you're going to hell. If you trust Jesus Christ, you go to heaven. And that 30-year-old is sitting there saying, those rules don't apply to me. I got to pass from dad. I got to pass from mom. I got to pass from the teacher. I got to pass from the principal. I got to pass everywhere I've ever been. God's going to give me a pass. But He's not. And I get labeled the bad guy because I'm telling you everybody in your life's lied to you. I'm not the bad guy. People gave you Santa Claus and rabbits instead of Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost are the bad guys. Romans 1, oh wow, we're, I'm, I'm running long. Romans 1, I may as well, you're not going to come back. Give, give you one good shot before you go. <laughs> Romans 1, verse 28, even as they do not like to attain God in their knowledge, God gave them over under reprobate mind to do those things which are reported in the news journal and the Orlando Sentinel. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. 
That's what you get if you allow people to do their own thing. They will not do the right thing. They will do the wrong thing. And the more absentee fathers we have, the more police we're going to have to hire. And the more mothers who bow down to their children we have, the more correctional institutions and prisons you're going to have to build. And the more people take their families out of churches where the preacher preaches the Bible and put them in some love-yourself mega-church wipeout, the more pills you're going to have to buy from your shrink. You're not crazy. You're a sinner. You don't have a mental problem. Your problem is you give in to your mind. You're supposed to give in to God. All right, one more, one more. 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now you got a chance here. 1 Corinthians eleven fourteen. 14. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it's a shame unto him. If a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. Now, since you have a God consciousness, and since God put within you some knowledge and understanding of right and wrong, it is possible, Father, it is possible, Mother, it is possible, school teacher, principal, Sunday school teacher, it is possible to teach people principles of right and wrong even if they're not saved. See, by nature, by nature, even lost people know certain things are appropriate and certain things are inappropriate. The anti-God school system in America and the anti-God media in America has worked for 40 years to make what is natural unnatural, and what is unnatural natural, and what is right wrong, and what is wrong right, so that pretty much everybody's completely confused. They don't even know what to teach their children anymore. And that's why you need to be in a church with a Bible, with a preacher who's not a pansy. Yeah. Amen. We're allowed to use that word? Yes, sir. I am. My dad didn't spank me for that one, so I know it's, I know it's okay. Somebody's got to stand up in front of people and say, this is right according to God, and this is wrong according to God, and you need to do it whether you agree with it or not until you agree with it. And once you get saved, you'll start agreeing with it and and things will get better. In your marriage, with your children, in your society, and and all the rest of that. Come on, we're we're living in a madhouse. It's just crazy out there. But it's not supposed to be crazy inside church. It's supposed to come here and and hear what the Bible says and agree with it. And if, if it goes against your family or your children or yourself, get it right. Don't leave and go somewhere where they're not going to criticize you because you're wonderful. (laughs) We're not. God is. God's wonderful. Jesus Christ is wonderful. Stop trying to force God to bow down to who you are by nature and repent of those things and let God have his way, have his work in your life. Amen. Amen. All right, let's pray. Father... As Daniel of old, we come to you and apologize for our nation, the shame that it must be to you, the embarrassment that it must be to you, a country full of people that that speak about you blessing them, but go so, so against everything you've asked and commanded. Lord, I pray that you'd help us as fathers, as mothers, as grandparents, as Christian witnesses, as Sunday school teachers, Lord, wherever we have influence, would you help us to escape this modern American lie 
of telling everyone that whatever they do and think is all right? And would you help us, Lord, to have the the love necessary and the courage necessary to tell people right from wrong and to encourage them to do the right? We thank you, Father, for helping us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let's sing a song. We had a perfect song to go with this message.